Praise God, hallelujah. Amen, praise God. A huge welcome everyone here this morning. And let's just stand and let's start our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. Please be seated. Can I welcome up Jenny? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church this morning. And if you're with us online, an extra special welcome to you. Today, we're going to just um, give you a bit of an update on community reach. And so we've got some uh, slides for you to have a look at. So thank you, Karen. Okay, so we're still continuing with our meal every week. And last week we catered for 60 people here in the dining room. And then we gave away 10 meals to people that are unwell. So we've been doing that on a regular basis. And even when the weather's terrible, people still come. And we've been serving afternoon tea from about 3.30 to 4. And um, that's been really good. We've been using the lunches that are left over from the Christian school, we pick them up and bring them here, and um, people are really hungry. And so to give them a warm drink and something to eat before their dinner is really special. Okay, we've um, been able to actually work with um, the Christian school as well in regard to a strength program, which is a personal development program for boys, and they're doing one for girls as well. Um, which is called Shine. And so we've been able to contribute $200 towards the running of this program. It's around significance, resilience, and courage for boys. And these are kids that are kind of 11, 12, 13. So it's really important in their development that they understand how to deal with some of life's challenges. We also have been gathering um, glasses. Remember I talked to you? We've got quite a few in our container and we'd like a few more. If you've got any sitting at home that you don't want or need, we'll package them up and have them sent overseas by either Rotary or Lions in the next few weeks. So at our um, team meeting, we always pray together and have afternoon tea for the community meal at three o'clock. We've been praying for quite some specific needs that we had and that week we saw God answer three of our prayers, which was amazing. The first one was that we were running short of meat. And you know how expensive meat is and how much it's gone up. And so between Simon and Tim Gale, we were able to get um, venison from the Seeker Foundation. And so I'm not sure how many kgs it is, but it's more than 50 kgs that they have given us. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> and then I had a lady walked in off the street and she'd seen the sign on the glass doors about the community meal. And she came and asked, could you explain to me what you do here and why do you do it? And I did, and then as she left, she gave me $50, and she said, put that towards your meat for next week. So that was really amazing, wasn't it? And then we've also been um, really praying that some of the people who come as our guests on a Monday night would really um, just feel part of church and come to some other things that we're having. And so last Wednesday, we had five people from our community meal come to our church service on, a, on the Wednesday. And one of the guys came rushing in and he said, look, I really need prayer because I'm struggling with some addictions and I want someone to pray with me because I just don't know what to do next. And Simon and someone else, Warwick, Warwick were able to pray with him. And so they're really feeling like this is their spiritual home, even they may not understand the word spiritual, but they feel that this is where they belong. So it's been a very exciting couple of weeks for us as a team seeing God answer our prayers. So keep praying for the meal. We're having um, a break over the next two weeks. We um, will be here tomorrow giving out pizza vouchers and bread and veggies. And so we still keep that connection going. That's from four o'clock. And then the following week is the same. And then the first week of term, we're back into meals again. So 
that's an update for you. Okay, we do also want to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays, and Simon's going to come. Does anyone, has anyone had a birthday or an anniversary in the last week? Would you like to come up, and Simon's going to pray for you, and then you get a chocolate. Only one today. There must be more. There must be some anniversaries. And anyone else? You don't have to be shy. Oh, I see someone's getting a nudge down there. You don't want one. Oh, well, get, maybe Simon will run the chocolate to you. But we just want to honour you today, and we want to bless you. So, Simon. Okay, thank you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for birthdays. We want to thank you for the milestones that we can uh, remember just in our presence, and I so richly pray a blessing over my brother that he would enjoy his day in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God, and chocolate for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. All righty. I'm sorry, that that was a small miscommunication. Please stand with us as we sing our first song this morning in Christ Alone. Yes. 
Church. Come on, please be seated. Hallelujah. All righty, this morning I, uh, I want to have a Bible reading. I want to explain a little bit about where, where the reading comes from because it makes so much more sense. It was a time that Paul wrote to these churches in Colossae, a whole area, a, quite a vast area made up of certain little churches. And they had this thing going down there where there was a clash in the spiritual teaching between what was being taught by the apostles and what these other teachers had started to creep into the church. And Paul's quite upset about it. As you read through the letter, you can, you can pick this up. And there he wants to point out with absolute accuracy the complete supremacy of Christ against all what they were being taught. And he writes this. Concerning Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. Such is the power of and majesty of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we acknowledge the almighty power and supremacy of Jesus, we pray that we would hold on to this truth, that as the world bombards itself with its philosophies against us, we would hold true to know Jesus and the victory that he has sustained for every single one of us through his blood shed on the cross, that we stand now as his inheritance, created by him and for him in every aspect. We want to commit ourselves as a church to you this morning in this very thing, that Jesus has given the Lordship over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Stand with us as we sing.
Praise God. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Let's just bow our heads. Let's just reflect and wait on God for a moment. Praise God. If you have a word of encouragement or a word that wants to build up and edify the body of Christ, please don't be afraid. Let's, let's pray together. Let's, let's enjoy what it is to be a body of believers, the priesthood of all believers, that we would all be able to reach into that spiritual realm and be used by the Holy Spirit to, to build up the church. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I call you my sons and my daughters. Praise God. I am your Lord. Yes, Jesus. The Almighty. As you will learn to walk with me in my ways, I will guide you. Do not fear, say the Lord, for I am there for you. Beautiful. I'm longing for you to have that relationship with me. Yeah. Beautiful. Come to me, my children. I will make you. Beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mighty God. We need you, Father. Give the young ones a safe trip tomorrow to come to your mm. fellowship place. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we just want to thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us every day, that your presence is forever with us. And as we align ourselves to your love, I pray that that would be something that we share out to others. We'd never forget that each and every one of us are on a mission. Pray that you would fill us fresh every moment with your spirit. Pour it out upon us that we would know what it is to stand in your presence day after day, be washed clean. That we would be people that pursue holiness, that seek your righteousness to be all that we are called to be. I want to commit this word to you this morning. I pray that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we are opening up a new series this morning. I like new series, amen? amen. I love it. Because it gives us the opportunity to explore something more of God. It reaches into our own spirits in a new and living way every time that we come to this place where we sort of approach God with this freshness. And so this morning we're going to be investigating something of the spiritual realm that every single one of us as Christians by default enter into. We're going to be looking at this teaching series that will benefit us as a follower. And the reason why I say that is because I've come to hear so often in conversations with Christians how certain things, conversations or titles or experiences that concern Satan or that concern demons or spiritual warfare or spiritual things can conjure up a little bit of fear. That creates more fear than really what it does victory. And so I think it's worth us having a good look at this. Amen? Often this is because past experiences that people have 
may have hurt them. It may have frightened them. Or experiences that they've even just heard about or seen on TV seem so false. It seems so weird, and it just doesn't fit with what it means to be the community of God. Yet, when you go to the Bible, when you look at Scripture, Scripture is loaded with the explanation that speaks into this, which really instructs all of us to understand this topic for the benefit of our well-being, not to frighten us, but for the benefit of our well-being that as the Bible teaches, allows us to know what it is to be victorious in Christ, to overcome those things that seem to strangle us or push us aside. I think it's so important that we get our heads around this. Amen? And so with this in mind, why I believe so many people have a fear of it, or are reluctant to enter into this realm is because there is so much negativity spoken in casual conversation about it. And this leads to bad information about this realm, which on top of that has the potential to leave us in poor of spirit and more vulnerable emotionally because of our lack of sound knowledge about it. Does that make sense? As an example of this, a true story is told of this young college student who won first prize as a, in a science competition that was held in his college. In his exhibition, he was attempting to show how conditioned we are and have become to the doom and gloom propaganda that's out there when it comes to spreading fear of everything about our environment through our lack of understanding or through bad experience. And so in his project, he urged people to sign a petition demanding stricter control or even total elimination of the chemical dihydrogen monoxide. (laughs) And for plenty of good reasons. It can cause excessive sweating and vomiting if you inhale too much of it. It can cause severe burns in its gaseous state. There's a major component of acid rain. That if you accidentally inhale it, it can kill you. And that has been found present in every single person who's suffering from any kind of illness. So he set out, he asked 500 people if they would support him in a ban of this dangerous chemical. 433 of his fellow students said yes, yes. 61 were a little undecided. And only six of them came back at him and said, hang on. H2O is water. You see, being badly informed about something that is presented to you with some sort of a clever twist all too easily leads us to believe wrongly about the subject. Isn't that true? So I ask before we go any further, if you're someone who's had a bad experience in this arena, if you have heard or watched something that doesn't seem to line up with the Christian way, please relax, because this is a teaching series. And it's going to be about learning from a biblical point of view concerning what the Bible teaches more than it is about being led into a place of opinions and experiences. So we can relax. My aim's going to be to have us better equipped in our knowledge of the spiritual realm. From a biblical point of view, that as Christians we are drawn into simply because of our allegiance to Jesus. In a lot of ways, our eyes have been opened simply by the Holy Spirit who has led us to this place. Welcome aboard. So what evidence is there of a spiritual realm that it even exists? 
I want to start here. Well, for a start, Scripture points out its reality very clearly and refers to this arena in a lot of ways that sometimes leave us a bit mystified. We read in Ephesians chapter 6, one of the most popular places that we would turn to, verses 10 to 12, where it's there called the heavenly realms. Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But it's not just a place of doom and gloom either. And we mustn't just leave it there when the Bible speaks more positively about it. Because the Bible also speaks about it as a realm where the presence of God and the community of the heavenly hosts inhabit. And interestingly enough, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the early point there, verses 2 and 4, Paul spoke about this in a moment of time when, for whatever reason, he was permitted to encounter this realm in a very, very tangible way. And it's really interesting to note what he says. Sharing this, he wrote down, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Only God knows. But I was caught up into a paradise, and there I heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. For Paul, just encountering this realm in this way was an amazing moment that there he viewed an existence beyond the human reality that we live in. I personally believe this occurred as it would be 14 years earlier when he encountered Jesus. And as he would then go on to teach from this experience about this place, about this realm, he explains all throughout his letters in little snippets here and there that it's a place that the authority of God and the supremacy of God exists and reigns supreme. The very place as Ezra, back in Nehemiah 9, 6, where Psalm 89, where Psalm 82, where John in Revelation explains that it is a realm where there is a multitude of heavenly hosts who are in constant worship of God. And we're right now as Paul has explained over and over again, Jesus is reigning as head of this arena. Paul tells us that this headship was always the plan of God. As I read, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, he says in Colossians 1.16. So question, how and why have things got to where they are today with Ephesians 6 telling us we need to take a stand against the devil's schemes in this realm? To take a stand against what appears to be rulers and against authorities and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in this same place. In contrast to the way God originally set up this realm, where all of creation was in awe of him and was locked into this deep sense of worship toward him. A place where Jesus now is seated as the head. So how and why is there now two realms that seem to be in conflict with each other 
that directly concerns every living person here on the planet, including you and me. And to answer that, I want us to go to the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament and how they explain what happened in the beginning of time where they reveal that Lucifer, an archangel of God, who had a free will, chose to rebel against God's authority and challenge God's supremacy for the right to rule. And that because of that rebellion, along with a portion of the angelic hosts that then sided with him, this mutiny resulted in them being banished from living within the close quarters of God's presence. And how with this banishment, it therefore brought about a second kingdom into existence. One that is in rebellion to all things of God. Jesus himself mentions the second kingdom in Matthew 12, when at this moment in time, the Jewish leaders were falsely accusing him of being involved in it. And he there comes back at them. And he says in verse 26, Matthew 12, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can Ortos Basilea, his kingdom, stand? Now, this in mind, and with this rebellious kingdom in existence, everything in the established order of God took on a change, including Lucifer's title, which was then changed to Satan, just as Jesus calls him in Matthew 12, which literally means the adversary, the opposer. So seeing this as it is, this therefore brought about two separate domains, as the Greek text explains it, or two separate authorities, as the Greek text also explains it, which are both spoken of in Scripture that to this day have an influential concern toward all mankind. Now this rebellious kingdom is referred to in Scripture in a lot of ways. We must pick up on this. Acts 26, 18, it there says that the disciples who were being sent out into all the nations with the mandate to open the eyes of the people so that they may turn away from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. From the dominion of Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul calls this dominion this world in whose case the God of it, little g, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, he then ad liberates on that a little and says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. In Colossians 1, verse 13, Paul there calls it the exousia hoskotos, exousia hoskotos, which literally means the realm of the power or the realm of the energy of darkness. What a beautiful description. The power or the energy of darkness. He goes on to say that from this place, every Christian who by faith aligns himself with Jesus is transferred. Transferred. That's positional. Transferred into the kingdom of the son he loves. Notice that he calls the realm of God's authority and supremacy here the kingdom of the son he loves. Two very distinct kingdoms that are in existence, that are in conflict 
for the realization of their reality to be in the forefront of the hearts and minds of every human being ever born. So how is humanity caught up in these two arenas? And the answer to that is this. Whichever kingdom you allow to be the influence over you will determine your alignment to it. It's as simple as that. Paul, throughout all of his letters, states that even though humanity has before them God's revelation of himself, particularly in his writing in First Roman, uh, Romans 1 and Romans 2, it's still up to them as to which kingdom they will allow the influence of to take precedence in their lives. And God has in his sovereignty, as a sovereign choice that he has made, allowed for this decision to be made by all of us concerning the life we get to freely choose. And then with that choice, the influence of that kingdom will over time only grow stronger and grow stronger as it becomes more and more the reality that they or we have chosen to align ourselves to. Choose whom this day you will serve was the clear-cut instruction that Joshua was told to give to the people as they entered into the promised land. Choose whom this day you will serve, just as it is for us today, for you and me. Because just like a seed that grows in soil, so will the influence of the Holy Spirit grow over us as we align ourselves to him freely. God don't want robots. God don't want to manipulate. Ultimate love allows us a free choice. And in ultimate love, the influence of the Spirit will grow stronger and stronger over us as we align ourselves to him freely. Jesus taught this principle. It was one of the very first principles he ever taught in Mark 4, in the parable of the sower. He then adds to that in Mark 4, 26, 28, to expand on that a little, where he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man who scatters seed on the ground, then night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, that seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how, because all by itself the soil will produce the grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. Such is the power of influence. Again in Matthew 13, 33, where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, a woman used in baking bread. Even though she put only a little in with the flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Such is the power of influence. But here's the thing. It's exactly the same with the kingdom of darkness. And it's energy when it is released. Why? Because whichever kingdom you allow to be the influence over you will go on to be the very influence that shapes your life, that shapes my life. Choose whom this day. In other words, it's by the influence over us that the direction of our lives will be determined, that the victories in this life will be claimed. So what about us? How then do we fit into all of this? This is the background. Where do we go? Well, for you and me, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we by faith have made the choice to align ourselves with the kingdom of God and the victory of the cross over sin and death 
And it's because of this decision that we now, by faith, have our names written in what Revelation calls the book of life, the membership book of God and his kingdom, where scripture says there is the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ over every citizen of that kingdom. That is the litmus test. The scriptures say that Jesus inaugurated this as his inheritance. So he dearly loves us. He jealously watches over us. He guards us. He stands as our kinsman redeemer. He protects us. And he will to the end. And that this will be completely realized once God ends Satan's rule and reign and rebellion at the judgment seat of Christ once and for all at the end of the age according to Revelation in verse 10. But in the meantime, as those citizens of the kingdom of the beloved Son, we live between Jesus' first coming to the earth and his next. And this means we live primarily not as New Zealanders, but as citizens of God's kingdom. Why? Because in the spiritual realm, here is where we find our true identity. And I think it's so important that we, as God's children, know our identity in him. And that we live according to that identity. And that we found that identity into our beings. And this identity then supersedes all others to the point that it becomes the ultimate reality of our existence. For the sake of our study and the series that we're going to be looking at, let's view our existence this way. Spend this week locking yourself down as a citizen of the Most High God. Amen. And with this understanding, we will then learn the benefits and the battles that exist as we make our stand for Jesus. But that's it for today. Because I want us to leave here this morning with our understanding at this point, being that between the two kingdoms that are in existence, you and I are aligned by faith to the kingdom of God. But that that doesn't diminish in any manner or form the kingdom of this world that is in rebellion to God and therefore against all of his citizens. We need to be aware of this. We need to be awake. My prayer is that because of this, all of us, as we journey through this teaching series, will make a mental adjustment that says, I'm not going to limit myself only to the things that I can see and touch and hear and taste as a Christian, but that I'm going to open my heart and my mind to the revelation that's recorded in God's word that there are two kingdoms in opposition to each other, and that in every way I am affected by them both as a follower of Christ. And with that, that I have the power to negotiate my way through this in absolute victory in Jesus. How? Well, we'll leave that till next week. Let's close in prayer. Lord, as we open up to explore your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would begin by just establishing us as your children. That we would know that we are children of the Most High God. That our citizenship has been found in the blood of the Lamb. And that we are His inheritance. And that we have been transferred into the kingdom of the Son that you love. And that we now stand in this place. I pray that you would fill us fresh every day every morning, every moment with your spirit that would enable us to be all that we are called to be, that we would have eyes wide open to the things of the spiritual realm, that we would walk in victory over the things that hold us back, that we would make this a chance for a new era in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand with us as we sing our final song.
May this be the blessing you take into the week. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.